episode of Attention. I'm your host, Coach Tina. Um, and today we're going to be interviewing a lady. Her name is Miss Dolores Michelle Peters. Um, Dolores, the pastor's daughter. She's a disabled veteran, national certified counselor, international bestseller, author of memoir series, The Pastor's Daughter Provoked. Yes. Hello. How are you Hi. doing today? How are you? Glad to have you. Glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Personally for you, do you need to be, to have, or to feel? All of the above. Oh. Uh -huh. I need all of the above. Can you go into it a little bit? Yes. Again? Well, I feel like we are spiritual beings and that there are components of us that, because we are living a human experience, that there's components of us that we tend to disregard. Right. Like our emotional being like we tell each other, well, you know, don't be emotional, but it's all part of who we are. So I feel like we need all of these components in order to really live in our true purpose. So I need I need it all. OK. All right. Nobody's going to put it like that. It's very interesting. Um, in your book, you mentioned about your father's past life with controlling and pimping women. What do you know about your father's life before his family? Well, really, all I know is what he preached about. And so there were occasions where he would preach about different things that he did. And the way he preached about it was in a way that he was excited about it. Like he was reliving like his glory days. Mm -hmm. And then there were parts of, you know, his past that he revealed to us as children that um, really instilled fear in us. You know, like he would he would talk about different things that he had done in the past, but it seemed like he did that around the time where he was disciplining us, yeah. you know, trying to let us know like what he's capable of, what he's done. Um, there were talks about him killing someone in the past, about different violent um, events that he had done. And it always seemed to be around a time where he was trying to really like instill some type of feeling in us, a threat or uh, wanting compliance from us so it's like hey you know this is the type of man that I am right and that's how that's how he really delivered it and it seemed like he did the same way in the church so whenever he would talk about his past life he glorified it it's like he wanted people to know this is who I really am mm -hmm. and I can always go back to that if I'm provoked mm. that's deep yeah. so what was it like being the pastor's daughter in school Oh, wow. So, I mean, there are there are a lot of perks, okay, to being a, a pastor's kid, okay? Now, we always hear about, you know, we always say, like, oh, the pastor's kids, you know, they're the worst ones. And, I mean, we probably had a bit of that, too. But, you know, in a lot of ways, it was rewarding. You know, it was like you would see, you know, your parents really make a difference in people's lives. You know, people seem to really need them. You know, so it was like very rewarding to see that part of it. And of course, I was um, I was a singer, you know, so I did praise and worship. I led praise and worship. I led the choir. Um, as I got older, I was over the youth. So I was very active in church and it was very rewarding and fulfilling. Of course, you know, there's a flip side. You know, there's a positive and negative to every everything that we go through. So on the negative side, it was like a lot of eyes on you, you know, a lot of scrutiny. You know, people would make assumptions about who you are based on the fact that, you know, I was a pastor's daughter, you know, so it's like, is she wild? You know, what is she, you know, what does she do? You know, and that type of thing. Um, but for the most part, I enjoyed it. Yeah. For the most part, I enjoyed it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in the book, you talked about being placed in um, German foster care. So I want to know, like, what yeah. was that like? What was that experience like to be placed? Well, okay. So first, let me go back to how we even ended up in Germany. Okay. Okay. So... Um, I was born in West Virginia, and originally my family is from Detroit. So all of my siblings, I have four brothers, uh, three older than me and one younger. And they were all born in Detroit. But during the time when my mother was pregnant with me, my father was in fear for his life. So he, we were actually on the run from um, things that he had done in the past, people that he had made mad. He felt like people were trying to kill him. Now, it came out like later on through like growing up that he believed that um, I'm not sure if you guys know Dietrich Haddon. He is a famous gospel artist and that is my first cousin. Mm -hmm. And so it was Dietrich Haddon's uh, father and um, and I believe a, a, 
a brother of his that was supposedly trying to kill my father. And this is back when they were like just getting started in church. So they were young ministers at the time. Now, so my mom was pregnant with me and we ran to Detroit. My father was trying to get clean from crack and um, just trying to get his life together. But still he was in fear for his life. So it's kind of like I was brought into the world, you know, with that type of trauma, you know, from my mom being pregnant with me at the time. So we, you know, went back and forth from um, uh, to Detroit and my father was still trying to find like his his place, you know. Um, but at the same time, there was that overtone of like, there's someone trying to kill him. And, and so he, uh, made my mother join the military and, um, and he told her, you know, get an overseas duty location. And since my father had already been to Germany previously in the seventies, when he was in the military, he felt comfortable going there. And, and so that's how we ended up in Germany. It was really based off of fear and um, an attempt to kill my father. Mm. And so that's how we ended up there. Now, once we got there, we experienced a lot of abuse from my father. Of course, now looking at it in hindsight, I believe that, you know, going to Germany was kind of his way of isolating, isolating us and really just kind of like inflicting the abuse that he wanted to without the eyes of his family. You know, they... Most of them are, are gospel artists, they're preachers, they, they have um, big churches. And so, you know, he couldn't really live in that same, you know, he couldn't be who he was, which was a crack addict, a, a gang banger, a pimp, you know, and all of that stuff. He couldn't live in with his family under those conditions, you know. And so he went to Germany and then he started, well, we all went and he started preaching there. And that's when he got his first church. Okay. So all the while, though, he's still abusing us. And um, we eventually came back from Germany and then went back again. But this time, we, the second time we went back, my mother wasn't in the military. And we were just living over there as civilians. So we lived in the German village. Uh, for a while, my brother and I, my youngest brother and I went to a German school. And we learned to speak the language and, you know, we were like pretty good at it, you know, like conversational. I don't know what it is, but kids tend to pick up languages much easier than adults do, <laughs> you know, so we picked it up pretty fast. Um, but my all the while, my father is still abusing us, but he's getting worse and worse and he's leaving bruises on us. You know, we're missing school, you know, because of you know, the bruises that we have, we're told to lie, you know, and say that we got the bruises from other ways, you know, and, um, it, had, he had had this one attack on my youngest brother that, you know, we, uh, we went to high school together yeah. and, um, he, he had cut my brother across his nose with, uh, I believe it was a belt buckle. And, um, he told my brother to, to tell them that he was playing football. And that was like, it was, that was like the last straw for me. You know, and I told my brothers, I sat them all down, uh, which, you know, I'm like the second to the youngest. So it was kind of strange that I did that. But I sat them all down and I said, you know, when I when we go to school tomorrow, I'm I'm going to tell I'm going to tell what he's doing to us. And um, and so that's what I did. That's and, amazing that you had the guts to do that and be in the second to the youngest. Yeah, I was probably 13 at the time. Yeah. And um. And so I told, and my youngest brother and I were removed from my parents' home, and we were placed in a German foster home. Now, the reason we had to be in a German foster home is because we were over there as civilians. We weren't, um, you know, military anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, my mother worked for the military. We weren't considered, you know, soldiers or anything. So we, um, everything had to be litigated through the German courts. And mm -hmm. so when they took us, they had to put us in a German foster home. Mm -hmm. Which was it was quite difficult for us because again, like we were we were Americans, you right. know, and we were Black Americans, and so it was like it was a, a very hard experience for us to um, to be in that foster home. Mm. Yeah. So, do you value honesty, integrity, or loyalty? I all of the above. All you know, above. I got <laughs> to go with it. All of the above again. Okay. <laughs> you know because. Again, I just feel like it it encompasses, you know, everything that needs to exist in a healthy relationship. Um, and it doesn't need to be blind loyalty. Um, you know, it needs to be loyalty that is purposeful, 
you know, and intentional and valued um, and not taken advantage of. Yeah, see me, I value integrity. Yeah, because I... The, I, I value that within myself, so I have to value that in other people. And I, I always want to believe that people are, you know, dealing with me with integrity. But when I find out, it always breaks my heart. But for me, I'm not going to change who I am. That's the most important thing to me is to know that people, when I say I'm going to do something, I do it. Mm -hmm. You can depend on me. You can count on me. Like, I'm I'm going to be there. And that's because I'm going to stay true to myself. So that's why I value integrity. All right. That's awesome. I love how you correlated the relationship between a father and a daughter affects the type of man that you choose. So tell us a little bit about how your relationship with your father affected the man that you chose. Oh, my gosh. Okay, first of all, which man that I chose? We're okay. going to get in all of it. We're going to get in all, right, all of it. <laughs> okay, so um, my first marriage, okay, was when I was 18. Um, I remember the... Really, the only re the advice that I remember my father giving me about men is to get married young because I wasn't going to be pretty forever. And that stuck with me. Um, and because of the experience that I had with him um, growing up, I was eager to leave the house. And so at the time, and I don't know if this was like a time period that we were in, but it just seemed like the only way that you could really leave your parents' house was to get married or like join the military or something, you know? And I wasn't, trying, I wasn't trying to hear the military stuff. So um, I got married and it was a very dysfunctional relationship. Um, I married someone who was very immature and that seemed to be the theme that I had throughout the marriages. Um Right now, um, I am married to my fourth husband. My forever husband is what I call him because net, when I made a decision um, that, you know, when I met him, I had already started doing the work to heal from my childhood trauma and the dysfunction that I had with my father. But I didn't really know that um, I was really making decisions based off of trauma until after my third husband, which is the one that you know of. And... Um, after I divorced him, it was a very, very, oh, oh my gosh, that divorce was hard. Um, whereas the other ones were kind of easy. So, you know, it kind of was like, you know, it kind of set a pace for me to like, okay, well, if I don't like it, then I get out of it easy. But that third one, it was, it was tough and I had children involved. Um, and there was a very contentious, um, you know, battle over custody and all of that stuff. And it really traumatized me. Um, but that's when I began to realize that, hey, I'm making decisions based off of my trauma and I'm picking people that are very immature because I don't want a man who is going to try to control me and try to manipulate me like my father did. So I chose men who I knew that I could manipulate and control. And but after that third way, you know, I had to get my mind right. <laughs> and I actually had a, a friend of mine to say he was like, you know, um, most women can't get one man to marry them, but you've had three. And that wasn't like a, a brag for me. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like, well, okay, well, I got, you know, all these husbands and stuff. You know, it wasn't like that. It was just like, what's wrong with me? You know? Mm -hmm. And so I had to actually do the work. And I just knew, like, I was not going to go into another marriage and, you know, without healing from my trauma. And so that's what I did. And now I have a healthy, thriving, successful relationship, you know, and that's why I say he's my forever husband, um, because I, I made the choice based on the right things. How did your diagnosis with both lupus and fibromyalgia affect your uh, everyday life? And did that, did you get diagnosed with that help you break ties with your father? It did. Okay. It, it really did. Um... I like I kind of teeter with this a little bit because I do feel a lot of blame towards him because of my health condition. Um, I believe that what you know I experienced and I was um, I started having symptoms of fibromyalgia again during that third divorce. Um, it was it was hard and I was in the military. I had a lot of things that happened to me uh, when I was in the military where um, I almost got kicked out, you know, um, they were thinking about taking my rank, you know, I ended up, um, uh, getting a medical retirement and I retired as a captain from the army. Um, but I had to fight for it, you know, mm -hmm. 
Um, but I believe that a lot of that childhood trauma, especially because, you know, my life was pretty much centered around the military. You know, my mom was forced to join the military, you know, and again, she was pregnant with me when all of this stuff happened. So once I finally joined and mind you, all of my siblings joined, uh, I was actually the last one to join. I had already received a master's degree before I joined the military. Um, and so my master's wasn't paying for itself. So I was like, well, you know, I guess I, I probably should just join the military. And plus, I was trying to get away again. <laughs> I was trying to get away from my parents and mostly my father. But really, I just kind of wanted to have like my own thing. And I wanted to be able to take care of my kids, you know, without having to stress about, you know, how do I actually move, you know, and just try to save up enough money. But the military allowed me to move and not, you know, and they took care of me, you know. So um, I ended up getting sick when I was in the military, and um, that's how I ended up with the medical retirement. I got the lupus diagnosis um, maybe a, a week or so after I left the church in 2019. And again, I try not to blame my father, but I do believe that the trauma that I was experiencing then really like led me to that diagnosis. And just before just before I experienced that, I um, the lupus diagnosis, I had had this um, major GI attack. And um, it resulted in me having um, my sigmoid colon removed and part of my intestines removed. Mm. And I could recall while I was going through all of that process, I would be sitting in church and I would be having panic attacks. And, you know, there's this book that's called The Body Keeps the Score. Right. That means that even though we are, you know, we are experiencing things and we may push them off, you know, we still live in our day to day lives. You know, we got kids to take care of. We got a job to where we got all this stuff to do. Your body is really keeping your your body is reacting to the traumas that you've experienced throughout your life. And that's what was happening to me at the time. And I just kept trying to talk to my father about the things that he was doing because I would see, you know, the abuse. He would be yelling at us, you know, condemning us. There were times he'd cuss in church and um, he would tell us we were going to die, you know, because he wasn't getting his way. And um, and my body was responding to that. Mm -hmm. And and so it was like my health is getting worse and worse while I'm here under, you know, under my father's spiritual leadership. And there has to be a connection. And so I got the lupus diagnosis shortly after I left the church. And there was a little bit of a moment where I was like, okay, did I just get this diagnosis because I left the church? You know, he's one of those that teaches that. Mm. Oh, well, your health is like that because you're not doing what I say. Mm. You know, you're experiencing these bad things in your life because you ain't listening to your pastor. You know, that type of thing. Gotcha. And um, that's what he would teach. So there was this moment where I was like, oh, my God, you know, I'm, I'm experiencing this because I'm being disobedient, you know, and I'm, and I'm wanting to leave the church. Um, but then my health started improving. Mm once I left and yeah. that was confirmation that it was him I feel you. so if you could go back would it be anything that you would change like would you have like left the church sooner or you know would it be anything that you would change hmm. I think about that too from time to time and I don't I don't think it would I don't think it would because I think that that would be dangerous for me to, to say, you know, to, to have regrets. I, I think that everything that happened, um, not that God did it, you know, but God is using it. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe that everything that happened was um, part of my overall purpose and my message and my calling now. Mm -hmm. And so everything I experienced, you know, I'm just using it for the good of myself, my family and other people. So since publishing your book, has any of your father's congregation reached out or contacted you? Yes. Yes? Yes. Was there it? are other people who are starting to speak out now. Yes. Um, a couple of people have been on my channel speaking out. Um, other people have confirmed, you know, the things that I said. And they were like, I thought I was crazy. You know, I thought I was the one in the wrong. And so I've been able to confirm to them, like, no, you were... You know, you were you were on point. And I think it 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 points back to discernment for me. Like that's my overall message is discernment, because a lot of times people were feeling like things weren't right, you know, in their spirit. But they dismissed it because it's like this is a pastor, you know, mm -hmm. it's a spiritual leader. It shouldn't be this way. I'm, I must be the one, 
you know, off. You know, I, my spiritualizations must be all jacked up, you right. know, because it, I, I couldn't, it couldn't be what I really think it is. And so my overall message now is like, you know, activate your discernment, increase your discernment and trust, you know, your discernment, you know. And so, yeah, people have reached out. And now they are, you know, getting the um, really like the help. I, I, I say help, but I, what I really mean is the community, you right. know, of feeling like I'm not by myself in this. Right. Instead yeah. of just following the norm and doing what everybody else does. Yeah. yeah. I feel you yeah. on that. I'm one of those people. <laughs> For real. Wow. You know, I grew up in church. My uncle's a preacher. You know, it's just... Mm -hmm. Lately, you know, over the years, you know, I'm not saying my uncle is like your your father. He's not, you know what I'm saying? He's a great man of God. But it's just that I've just been noticing things, you know what I'm saying, right. that don't really have necessarily to do with the church. But since it's correlated, it's religion. Mm -hmm. I'm more spiritual now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's just where it is. Yeah. You know, you got to seek for yourself. You can't just right. listen to what somebody tell you. Right. Like if you can manipulate somebody that easy, you can not have like any education, no qualifications, and and people will give you unlimited access to their whole lives. Like pastors get access or spiritual leaders get access to people that nobody else gets. Right. Like you get access to their finances, you know what they're relationships are like their sex life is like um their kids you get access to their kids you know they'll just people just send their kids right on up to the right. past and just you know well thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of attention um if you have any topics or anybody that wants to be a guest please hit me up at sunflower speaks at gmail.com and remember experience to teach don't just learn <laughs>